Matthew chapter 9, if you would, in your Bibles, please. Matthew chapter 9. I appreciate so very much the church of God. And I'm looking forward to gathering. Hey, there's something about corporate worship. Let me just tell you this real quickly. I reminded about it today. When we come together, and you just can't do live stream church. That's just, you can't do it. A church is a called out assembly. Now, I'm thankful for it. I think it's, a, it's a maybe the second best. At least you can hear God's word. You can be stimulated in God's uh, truth. We kind of keep the uh, missionaries in front of us. But church is not just listening. Church is not just watching. Church is assembling. And I want you to get that in your head. Get it deep down into your heart. Do not think that you can substitute church attendance by just watching. I appreciate that some folks are elderly, some folks their health is compromised, and it's wisest for them to wait it out. You do what God wants you to do. But when God lets you uh, to be faithful again physically, you ought to be Sunday morning, Sunday night, and midweek service. I believe it's important. Uh, the Bible tells us, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a man or some is. If Jesus were alive today, I think he would tell you, get yourself to the house of God. We get to start that on Sunday morning, Sunday night, midweek service. And I want to encourage you because three things happen. Number one, when we attend church, uh, we strengthen our vertical relationship with God. That's what happens. Number two, we strengthen our horizontal relationship with others. And where those two meet right there, there is something that happens spiritually inside of us. The Bible tells us to exhort one another. You can't exhort me uh, from your couch. <laughs> uh, I can't exhort you from my couch. We need to be together for that. By the way, when you come to church, don't come to church to get something. Sometimes I hear young people pray, Lord, give me something tonight in the service. Get me, help me, help me get, help me, help us all learn something. Help us to, and by the way, it's not a terrible prayer because that is part of the church assembly. But don't get into a habit of going to church to get something. Because there's sometimes you'll have needs that that service will not, uh, it's, it's not going to give to you. That's just the truth. Uh, sometimes it's going to be the case. You, know, you may have a need that you want to know how, what to do with finances at your, at your job and you come, home, you come to church and it's a Mother's Day message, okay? That happens sometimes. It's, it's the case. But if you go to church to give, give of your attention, give your participation, give of your prayer, give of your provocation to one another and your exhortation, your love. Hey, listen, there's a lady sitting out there. She's been by herself all week long and you ought to get up off your blessed assurance and go talk to her. Teenager, don't just sit with your friends. Go find somebody. I was burdened on Sunday and I hope this didn't happen. I just, I couldn't see good enough. But there was a man sitting by himself, a first time visitor. There's a lady on my left sitting by herself, a first time visitor. I said it in a hint. I hope somebody will get with them and love them and encourage them. They took a blue bag, but I don't know if anyone got to them. And if they didn't get to them, woe is us. It's our fault. We ought to make, we ought to make ourselves a welcoming committee of one. And when you see other brothers and sisters of Christ, there ought to be time to love them and encourage them and get out of your comfort zone and do something one for another. Because the church is not just a place we hear a message and we get something. It's a, it ought to be a mentality, hey, what am I going to bring to the service? I'm going to bring a song in my heart. I'm going to bring a spring in my step. I'm going to bring a verse that God's spoken to me about. Hey, what is fellowship? The Bible says the early church continued in doctrine, the apostles' doctrine. That's the Word of God. So we have the New Testament uh, a part of our Bible now. The apostles' doctrine. They, uh, they continued in prayers. That's why every service going forward, we want to have a prayer time. Sunday morning, Sunday night, midweek service. I think we want to have a time where we sincerely look to the Lord together. That ought to be as natural as breathing for a Christian to pray. And then a time of fellowship. That is revolving around the person of Jesus, of God, of spiritual things. That's not talking about our business or the Cubs or the Bears or the White Sox. That's talking about the Lord. That's talking about Him. Fellowship on the person of Christ and then the breaking of bread. And I think that is a remembrance of the person of Jesus. Every service ought to be filled, exalting God's Son, hearing God's Word, and enjoying the love of God's people. And I pray that you will be a part of that. Spread the love when you come to church on Sunday. And look for a way that you can be a blessing to the service in some way. I know God will be glorified. 
Well, we find here a, a passage of Scripture in, in Matthew chapter 9. And uh, I've been thinking about this because I love that the fact that the church has been given a job. Its job is to win the lost, to disciple the saved, and train those who are discipled. I'm grateful that in 1972, Dr. Hiles was used of the Lord and Dr. Anderson to start Hiles Anderson College. And uh, I remember hearing the story. I've been to the road, I believe, where Dr. Hiles walked one evening. He couldn't rest. In Pomona, California, as he walked down that service road beside the hotels there, he was preaching at a church in, in uh, Central Baptist Church in Pomona, California. Dr. Ray Batema was the pastor at that time. I got to see Brother Batema just recently. He's still serving the Lord and still being used of God to tell folks about Christ. And I'm thankful for that. But he was there preaching at that great church. I've been there numbers of times. I've had the joy to preach there several times. With a burden on his heart to do something for America, to reproduce what God had been putting in his heart, to put a fire in the pulpits, to put soul winners on the street, to send people out that, that would disciple others, that would win the lost and train others to do the same thing. That was his burden. He believes that that was the time that God called him to start Hiles Anderson College. He didn't know the name of the college at that time. He just knew that he had a passion to do that. A few weeks later, he was preaching for Brother Clyde Gilman out in, in New Mexico, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And he asked Dr. Russell Anderson to accompany him on that trip while he preached. And on Tuesday afternoon, he and Dr. Anderson went over to the little mall across the parking lot from their, from their hotel. And they walked inside that mall and they walked and talked for a long afternoon discussing what God had put on his heart. And Brother Anderson, out in the parking lot of that mall, said, Brother Jack, if that's what God wants you to do, then I'm going to help you do it. And he put together the results of a hard work and diligence in his business and his financial wherewithal with a man who had a passion and that was in 1972. They opened the doors the very first time. Brother Jerry Vargo was the first accepted student, a bus kid from First Baptist Church of Ham. And Brother Howells wanted a bus child to be the first one to uh, be chosen as a student. And boy, what a great testimony that was. And since that time, I think nearly 39,000, coming up almost on 40,000 people have come and taken a class at Howells Anderson College. Many, many of those have graduated and have degrees. Many of them have, according to Dr. Uh, Dr. David Gibbs, he says, Hiles Anderson has been responsible to put more Christian servants into the local churches than any other college that he's familiar with. A lot of folks are training folks, and we're not the only college. We're not necessarily the best college, but I thank for the heritage of putting out servants of Christ who are not find that they're, the, what, what, uh, what uh, strokes them is just not what they can do on Monday through Friday, but what they can do in a bus route, what they can do in a Sunday school class, what they can do through soul winning, through discipleship. And I'm thankful for that. Thirteen years after Brother Hiles started the college, I had the joy to come here and to be a part of this institution. And of course, Dr. Young back then, Dr. Daryl Moore, Dr. Evans, Wendell Evans, Dr. Jorgensen were instrumental in my heart and my life. And many other great teachers and instructors through the years have loved us and helped us. And I am one of those 39,000 plus folks who've received their education here. But it's not so much about an education, it's about influence. It's about following what God wants people to do. And I believe during this time of this pandemic, God is still calling young people. He's still calling single adults. He's still calling married men and their wives to do something for the Lord Jesus Christ. But most of us need some preparation. I sure did. Some of us need a spouse. This summer, we've had a plethora of, of weddings. We've already had, I don't know, 10, and I think we have probably 15 more. Uh, some here at First Baptist Church and many more across the country. It thrills my heart to know that the combination, the synergy of two young people who have devoted their lives to the Lord, who met each other here at a good Bible college, are now speckling themselves around the world to do the work of the Lord. And we didn't think up that on our own. I know that God calls people. God is working. 
And he had this same burden. The same burden as I walked the, the auditorium this afternoon and spent some time talking to the Lord as I thought about Hiles Anderson College. And, of course, Brother Anthony told us about the tour groups. I couldn't, I wanted, I knew that it would be challenging to have a tour group. But we wanted to do, do something. We wanted to send all five of them out. And then it just became obvious it would be more challenging to do that and probably not possible under our circumstances with the time that we had to make the decision and the situation as we knew it. I'm so grateful for these young men. Each of them represent somebody, some church, some mama, some daddy, some youth conference, some camp, some Christian school chapel, some Sunday school teacher and Sunday school worker, some junior church that God got a hold of their hearts and they surrendered themselves to serve the Lord. And I, I love that. I'm thankful that my own children had the opportunity to come to Hiles Anderson College. And by the way, may I say to you, any place where people are being prepared for the gospel ministry, I'm all in. I'm, I'm for it. I'm for Golden State. I'm for West Coast. I'm for, for uh, Commonwealth. I'm for Vision Baptist. I'm for Crown College of the Bible. Any place where God is using to prepare people for a lifetime of ministry. Heartland Baptist in Oklahoma City probably shouldn't start naming names. New England Baptist, Upper Brother Townsend. Any place where people are being trained for local church ministry, soul winning, discipleship. I'm all over that. And I, you should be all over it. We should be, be supporting that. But I do believe that God is laying on the hearts of people right now. Now, they may not be listening to this broadcast. They may not be listening where you are. But somewhere, God is working. Somewhere, there's someone out there saying, you know, I know there's more to this life than just punching a time clock. God wants me to do something. And for those young people and for those young adults and those married couples, I want to keep the doors of Hiles Anderson College still moving back and forth. Someone I talked to a dad yesterday sat down beside me in Nashville, Tennessee, and he said, my daughter's been dreaming about coming to Hiles. Will you open this fall? I said, yes. I said, yes, with God's help, we're going to open this fall. The Lord willing. Talked to another man. He texted me. He said, hey, I heard you're in Nashville. My daughter, Naomi, is wanting to come. She's been dreaming about it. And uh, is everything still good? I said, we're still good. I believe as long as there's a God in heaven, there's a reason for people to be trained for the gospel ministry. And I'm excited about it. I'm excited about it for this passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 9. And I want you to look at it with me, if you would, please. Verse number 32. The Bible says this, and they went out, this is Jesus and his disciples, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with, with a devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb man spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying, it was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, he casteth out devils through the prince of devils. And Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their, in their synagogues and preaching, the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Would you read verse 36 with me? Wherever you may be, read it with me, would you please? But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. As a sheep having no shepherd, verse 37 says, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Everyone together, would you read the next one? Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Father, in the next few moments as I share just a, a few things on my heart, I pray you'd help me. I do not want to bore the people, nor do I want to monopolize their time, but I do want to share what I believe you want me to share, and I pray you'd help me to do it. Thank you, Lord, for Hiles Anderson College. Thank you for the burden that it started to put fire into the young people and young men to do something with the work of the Lord that you called them to and with the God of the work. Please help us. I pray that that would be multiplied over and over and over again. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to preach. Thank you for sweet friends who would listen. In Jesus' name, amen. So I was thinking about how Anderson College is a place where there's been a lot of sacrifice done. In 1974, when they wanted to purchase the present campus, $2.5 million. And uh, they were trying to raise the money. Eighty-three people took off their wedding bands and put it in the offering plate. Becky Martin was one of those ladies. 
Uh, she was going off to, she would be just a few years later, four years later, three years later, going off to uh, work and has worked for 42 years in the Philippines, pulled her wedding band off and put it in there. It's been a great sacrifice. A great many people who are with Jesus now took their ring off and put it there and gave generously and wrote checks and prayed and earnestly asked God so that you and me uh, could have a place where we could be trained for the gospel ministry. We owe so much to the heritage. Oh, there's been some challenges and there's been some difficulties, but how thankful I am for the privilege to have gone there and have learned. Most everything I do today, I learned my early stages in the ministry of a bus ministry under the tutorage of great teachers, great classes. Uh, the best friends I, ever, I have ever had have been formulated in dormitories and opportunities to go to, go to bus meetings together and prayer meetings and captain's meetings together. I, I see people all the time that we have that uh, commonality and we have the opportunity, that camaraderie that God gave us early in our years. And I'm thankful for that. And for those of you who are First Baptist Church members who are here in 1972 and 73, faithfully giving and serving and praying for the college and have supported all these years. I think of several people and they just, uh, they love the school. I talked to someone this week and, and last week and the week before and they said, Pastor, if we can, we want to help the tour group. We know they may go through some difficult times. They may have to get a few more hotel rooms they had planned. We want to help the tour group. And I thank God for that. The many, many, many folks throughout our history that have loved us and helped us. And I want to thank you personally. It was here that I came as an 18-year-old young man. It was here that God called me and, and, and put me into the ministry. And I'm so thankful for the ministry. We see here several things. Jesus and his disciples, the Bible says in verse 32, they went out. I want you to notice, first of all, the steps that were happening here. First of all, he went out. Do you know he went out to villages? He went to the synagogues, the places of worship. He went to the cities. He went out. And the first thing I think we need to understand is everybody needs to go out. <laughs> uh, listen, not very people are going to come to your house, knock on your door, and ask you, what must I do to be saved? Most people that win to, that win to Christ, one to Christ, or one to Christ because somebody goes out. You can't spell the gospel without go. And I want to encourage you, church family, you do that uh, as an individual. Do that as a family. Go out. And as we start our bus ministry, and I hope it's not too long, in just a few weeks, I hope someone will jump on a bus route and say, you know what, I'm going to help them. I'm going to help them restart. I'm going to give, my, I'm going to give 12 weeks to this bus route. I'm going to do my best to continue on this. I'm going to drive that bus again. I'm going to go out, and I'm going to help uh, somebody reach others for the cause of Christ. I believe this could be a great harvest of souls if somebody would just go out. Number two, the Bible says Jesus went out and they brought to him a, a man who couldn't speak because he was filled with a demon. Jesus relieved him of the demon. The man spoke. Everybody was happy. He was happy. His family was happy. But the, the Pharisees said, oh, he just does that. He cast out devils in the, under the, the dominion of the prince of devils. And of course, in other passages of Scripture, we see that Jesus had something to say about that. Here in the Matthew's Gospel, he just uh, goes out and goes to another city, another town, another village, another synagogue, and keeps preaching the gospel of the kingdom. But the Bible tells us something beautiful here. He says that he saw the multitudes. The first step is going out. Number two is your eye affects your heart. He saw the multitudes. Have you seen the multitudes lately? When that person takes care of you at Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks or at the restaurant that you go to, do you just see them as, do you sit in an intersection and watch people turn car after car and it does nothing to you? I think of what Jeremiah said, is it nothing to you all ye that pass by? Does it not matter to you? Boy, I've been overwhelmed in recent days. Thinking about our area, Thinking about that little 12-year-old boy that was shot and killed the other day in Gary. Thank God for a soul winner last year leading him to Christ on a Saturday afternoon with his twin brother. Does it nothing to you? Red, yellow, black, and white, does it matter to you that people are without Christ? The Bible says that he went out. Number two, he saw the multitudes. Not just the individuals, but he saw there was a lot of people that need the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice the next thing, the next step. He not only went out, he saw, but he was moved with compassion. 
Our Savior was moved with compassion when He saw the people. And I want you to see the steps. That's why I want you to go out. That's why you need to go soul winning. That's why you need to work on the bus route. That's why you need to get out there because getting out there changes you. It causes you to see something you can't see sitting in your living room. It, saw, it caused me to see something I can't see sitting downstairs in the office. I was burdened with that today, thinking to the Lord and talking to Him. I said, Lord, please don't let me become captivated by an office or a responsibility, a position to the place that I will not get out and talk to folks about Christ. I was blessed to hear of Lawrence Williams leading two people to Christ and Brother Abdel leading someone to Christ today and someone else got saved yesterday and sit across the, 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 the chair from a man yesterday and begin talking to him about Jesus Christ and encourage him to accept the Lord. Seeing a politician today and remind Reminding him, I'm praying for him to come to know the Lord. Last time I spoke with him, he said, Pastor, no one's ever explained that to me. I've been to hundreds of church services. I don't know why I never got that. He said, that's about as clear as I've ever heard it, what I need to do. And he said, I'm not ready to make such a commitment. I appreciate his honesty, but I'm praying for his soul. I want to see God save him and bring him and his wife and his girls to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, listen, friends, we want to make sure that we see that we go out, we see, and we're moved with compassion. What is compassion? Compassion is love in action. It's, it's loving someone enough to do something about it. You can say you love the bus ministry. You can say that you love the Lord. You can say, and I can say, well, I love souls and I love soul winning. But we really don't until we do something about it. We can say, I love missions. But if you don't give to missions, you don't love missions. You're not praying for missionaries. You're not really in it. Thank God for people who are in it to win it. Those are the people that have affected my life and your life. And I want to be someone who is touched by God to touch other people. And I want to encourage you to do the same thing. Number one, I want you, I want you to notice the steps. Number two, I want you to notice the state of the people. Would you look, if you would please, at verse number 36. The Bible tells us, He was moved with compassion on them, on the people. Why? Because they fainted. They were scattered abroad. As sheep having no shepherd. They were tired. They were scattered. They were on their own. Lonely without being in a flock together. Not feeling the companionship. Not feeling the, the camaraderie of the love of Christ. And they had no shepherd. No direction. No one who cared about them. You know there's not much change in 2,000 years. You start looking to the, to the eyes of people. At the airports, at the, uh, at the high schools, you look at the campuses, you look at places in the malls, and you'll see in the eyes of people that they're tired. They're sick and tired of being sick and tired. There's a lot of noise out there. They don't have answers to their problems. They don't have answers to their fear. They're tired. They're feeling lonely. Suicide rates are up. You know why? Because of loneliness. Loneliness, a lack of purpose. They feel like they're all alone in this world. No one cares for their soul. They don't have a shepherd. They don't have somebody who loves them. There's bus children need a captain. They need a bus worker. There's a Sunday school teacher that needs someone to love them and care for them and be a shepherd of their soul. There's a family that's struggling to keep their marriage together and needs someone to shepherd them. Why? Because they're tired. They're scattered and they're lonely and they have no one that cares about them. And it bothered the Lord Jesus Christ. Does it bother you? Does it bother me? He went out, he saw, he was moved with compassion on them because of their state. Then I want you to notice here the shortage. After Jesus saw it, he seems to say to his disciples, Guys, the harvest is plenteous, but the labors are few. The shortage is not with the harvest, the shortage is with the labors. Here's why I think most people won't do it, because they have to labor. To be a Rick and Becky Martin, we can cheer for them. We can say yes, but I'm telling you, I've been to their home. I've been to that hot place. I feel like I'm in the Philippines right now in the studio. It's hot up here. I remember my wife saying that's the hottest place I've ever been in my whole life. Just get done drenched in sweat. But see these Filipino people coming to know Jesus Christ our Savior. You know what it takes to do that? It takes labor. That's why Jesus tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why house Anderson College? 
because people need to go out. They need to see. They need to be moved with compassion. There's a state, and the state is terrible. People are lonely, and they're going to be lonely. I remember a song I heard years ago, Think What It Means to Be Lost Forever. No one to guide you across death cold river. Darkness crying, none to deliver. Think what it means to be lost. Oh, I think many of us, we've forgotten how terrible it is to be unsure of your salvation. How terrible it is to be lonely without hope, without God in this world. And then the shortage is labors. It's people willing to serve the Lord, willing to do. The, so many people, they're willing to make a paycheck. They're willing to get more stuff and, and keep their stuff and talk about how much stuff they have. Getting caught up with the material things of this world. And the Bible tells us as a soldier, hey, don't get entangled with the affairs of this life, but please him who have chosen you to be a soldier. I think many of you, God's given you a gift to turn a buck and to invest in the things of God. And that's what God wants you to do. Do it. Don't just say you're doing it. Do it. Give aggressively. But if God's called you to the ministry, prepare for the ministry. Love Jesus Christ. Get out there in the field and be moved with compassion because the folks are out there with a tremendous, terrible state. And the shortage is not in finances. It's, it's in laborers. It's in people willing to go. What's the solution? Look at the last verse, would you please? The solution is prayer. Praying, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth labors into his harvest. As you pray and as you think about these truths, this is why I believe God put Howes Anderson College and great colleges like it on the map. Why they're so needed is because there's a God in heaven who asks us to pray for labors. Prayer is something we need to do regularly. And pray the Lord of the harvest. You know why? Because He loves the harvest. He wants it to be reaped. There's only so little time to do that. That He'll send forth labors. Those of us at First Baptist Church, I want to encourage you to pray for Hiles Anderson College. Not because of the name, not because of the legacy, but because for labors. Brother John told us tonight, would you please pray for the safety of our tour groups and pray for any tour group you know that's out there. Pray that God will give them safety, safety from the COVID, safety in their travels, safety in their, in their moving about, the miles they'll take. Pray for souls to be saved and souls to be encouraged and pray for labors. Students who would say, you know what, I'm ready to prepare. I think there's a great need for that. The disciples had three and a half years with the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man. I think almost uh, every young person could be benefited by three and a half years of at least education and preparation for what God wants you to do, not only in, in academics but in practical uh, help. I want to ask you to pray for the college. Pray that God would give us numbers of young people. I'd like to see God do something miraculous this fall that we would have even more students we had last fall and we had a great fall enrollment. I believe God is calling. People need to answer the phone. We need to pray and earnestly ask God to help us. Young person, if you're listening to me tonight, get your head off the dollar bill. Don't start thinking about that. Don't think about comforts. Think about converts. Think about the opportunity to do something that would last for eternity long after you're dead and gone. Your life can be used to glorify God and bring countless people to Christ.